In 2008, adventurer Mark Beaumont smashed the world record, cycling around the globe in just 194 days. Now he's got an even more ambitious dream. To cycle the length of the longest mountain range on Earth. The Rockies and the Andes. This epic 13,000 mile expedition will take Mark from Alaska to the bottom of Argentina. And not content with that, Mark will attempt something never done before, combining the cycle with climbs of North and South America's highest mountains. This is a nine month adventure where the spine of the Americas will take Mark's body and mind beyond anything he's experienced before. From the wild animals. A mum with young cubs, that's <laughs> not to be messed with. To the isolation. The only other guy out here is this one over here. I've not lost it yet, don't worry. The desert heat. It's hard to describe proper dehydration if you've never had it, but oh, it's a craving like nothing else. And the altitude. That was one of the scariest experiences of my life. This is the man who cycled the Americas. Mark's beginning his epic journey close to Anchorage in Alaska. Having said goodbye to friends and family back home in Scotland, it'll be more than half a year until he sees them again. On his bike, he's hauling 30 kilograms of kit, from medical supplies to cameras and a tent, everything he needs to survive alone and film his adventure. That mountain range I'll be following at the speed of a bike for the next eight months until I get to the southern tip in Ushuaia in southern Argentina. It's the longest mountain ridge on earth. So there's nothing left to be done except for, uh, except for get on the road. Mark's journey begins near Anchorage and for the only time on his adventure takes him north, 114 miles to the town of Talkeetna near the base of North America's highest mountain. Great relief just to be on the go, wheels rolling after all the preparations. The bike feels fantastic. I just don't know what's around the corner and that's going to happen for the length of the Americas uh, for the next seven, eight months, however long it might take. That's pretty exciting. A punishing high altitude climb so early in his journey means there's a real risk that physical fatigue could jeopardize the rest of the expedition. So any chance to top up on the 6,000 calories Mark needs daily is a must. Not easy for a man who doesn't normally eat meat. There is no, no option to be a vegetarian here. News that an adventurer is in the restaurant has reached the owner who can't wait for Mark to meet his family. How are you doing? How you doing? No, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. You're going to hear so much about Good to meet you, how are you? Yeah, good. What was your name? I'm Bob. Bob. He's my little brother. Hey, listen, can I pray for you before you go? Sure. Okay, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for bringing Mark in, into our life. God just crossed some paths with him. He's on an ambitious journey, Lord. He'll be climbing one of the highest mountains in the world soon. And Lord, I just pray for his safety. He'll have the right weather. Lord, that everything about that climb, God, will just work smoothly. I just pray your blessing upon him, your strength, your protection, and all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, buddy. Amen. Good to see you. I started Thanks so to much. Ruin, your, ruin your burger there. No, nice no, to meet it's, you. it's probably too warm right now, so that's great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I just had one. It was so good. Oh, my goodness, to make a good burger. Thanks, Bob. Cheers. Nice There's a reason they are praying for Mark. He's about to leave our cameraman behind to climb North America's highest summit, Mount McKinley. It's known as Denali by the locals, which means 
the Great One. At 20,320 feet is not as high as Everest, but the climb from base camp to summit is actually further. And because of its polar latitude, it's one of the coldest mountains on Earth. Nothing lives up there. Nothing lives on that mountain, man or beast. And so for us to be able to survive in those climates, you've got to have quite a lot of stuff. I'm in a team, but I'm completely self-sufficient in terms of pulling and a sledge and carrying on my back all the kit I'll need, all the food I'll be eating, and we'll just be getting the, the water we need from melting the snow around us. There's no guarantee of success. McKinley's unpredictable weather means only one in two people make it to the summit, and a hundred have died trying. At this point, Naturally, there's nerves, you know, I'm, I'm about to set out and for the first time go to high, high altitude, push myself definitely beyond what I've done before. My comfort zone's way out because I know how to ride a bike, but this is different. Psychologically, it's going to be a tough one. If McKinley isn't a success for whatever reason, I've got to somehow be able to come off that mountain and get on the bike and pedal for the next half a year before I get to the next mountain and keep that focused. Mark's joining an eight-strong team that are being dropped onto the barren Cahiltna Glacier. It will take three weeks of hard slog to reach the summit. I've got the first sight of the summit of Denali, which looks spectacular. It looks a long way away and it looks very high. Even before he can think about reaching the summit, Mark has to spend the next two gruelling weeks shuttling food and supplies up through a series of self-built camps. There's no help from porters here. For a solo athlete who's used to pedalling at speed, by day nine, the pace and the living conditions are proving testing. There's actually a lot of time spent during high altitude mountaineering which is acclimatization which is just letting your body adapt to you know the cold and the and the height we're at and that's uh that's quite hard to get used to i'm used to expeditions where you're pushing it i'm on my own and to be out here hemmed in with so many people and you can't move out of a small area because of crevasse risk it's quite hard i find myself having big mental highs and lows each day just to to deal with that Mark's now reached over 14,000 feet, and so far, McKinley's weather is holding. This is where the climbing really begins, with a 3,000-foot push to high camp. From here on up, it's not just the weather that can be lethal. McKinley's northerly latitude brings thinner air, meaning there is a higher chance of oxygen starvation. I know that McKinley has a real risk of high altitude mountain sickness and if you're not careful this can easily be fatal. Pretty slow work, heading up the head wall soon and then along the ridge line, kind of feeling the altitude. Yeah, it's one of the toughest, toughest challenges of my life, that's for sure. After 10 hours and the most physically demanding day of his life, Mark's made it to high camp. At 17,200 feet, this is the highest he's ever been. What a view! That is incredible. That just drops by three, 4,000 feet. Not every climber, though, has been as fortunate. I looked across and I saw two what I thought were rocks falling off the mountain and um, it quickly became obvious that they weren't rocks. They were two climbers who had fallen off the ridgeline and um, both climbers died. Both climbers didn't survive the fall. At this altitude, nothing is easy. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing how different the, 
the areas up here, just putting up the tent, digging holes to put the 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 strings in, what they call parachutes to keep the tent down. You're absolutely exhausted within a couple of minutes. The the, the air is that much thinner, even from where we were this morning at uh, just over 14,000 feet. And you can hear the wind in the tent. After two days of acclimatization, it's summit day. Mark is finally closing in on his dream to scale North America's highest mountain. I've been kidding myself all along that, you know, the experience on the mountain is enough and summiting isn't everything, but I really, really want to summit. It's the first big challenge of this, uh, this America's expedition. Lethal weather allowed just three summit days in the previous month. It's in the last eight hour push to the top that sudden storms have killed many an able climber. I'm always conscious that the weather can change very, very fast and um, it's so exposed, there's nowhere to hide if the weather does get bad and that could be dangerous within minutes. That's the first sight of the summit. It is really hard just to keep moving up here. The air is so thin. We've only got about another two hours to go. I've got no doubts I'll make it. But Mount McKinley has other ideas. A sudden snowstorm comes out of nowhere to engulf the team. Despite the danger, most of the team, including Mark, make a dash for the summit. It's uh, too cold and blustery to say any more. I'll explain later. The worsening blizzard gave Mark just a few heart-stopping seconds to savour his 20,320-foot climb, one of the greatest ascents on Earth. In the end, Mount McKinley lived up to its reputation. I don't know what to say. We've been, uh, I suppose I should say, hooray, we've uh, summited Denali, but uh, I'm a bit shell-shocked at the moment. That was one of the scariest experiences of my life. After three weeks of climbing, it takes just three days to get back to base camp. Well then, hey, can you this? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> what is it, half past seven in the morning? You ready for breakfast? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm ready for a beer. <laughs> beer in Tokitna. And while the other mountaineers have plenty of time to recover, Mark, who's lost a stone in body weight, has to get back in the saddle and head off alone into the wilds of Alaska. The next leg of Mark's daunting expedition is taking him from Talkeetna and into the Alaskan wilderness, followed by the mountains of Canada's vast Yukon Territory. Mark is entering some of the most isolated, beautiful and unspoiled expanses on the planet. But this great natural wilderness brings its own dangers. That was my first sighting of a bear, <laughs> and it was a little bit too close for comfort. I actually cycled right past it within two, three meters of the road before I, I, I realized what it was. It was a black bear, so I stopped, got the camera out, but it started looking at me funny, so I wasn't gonna hang around. <laughs> Great, first bear. Well, I've seen her at midnight, and I'm in awe through the day. I've seen the northern lights, they've danced all night in destruction day. Pretty horrible first full day in Canada. The Yukon's full of roads which are 
just uh, gravel for miles and miles, which is, which is really tough going. Every time vehicles go past, you just get pelted with pebbles. To be honest with you, I'm not feeling fantastic. There's just days when you feel pretty rubbish in the bike. The legs are tired. I'm not covering the ground very fast. And uh, yeah, I just need a big night's sleep, I think. I'm gonna stop at the one of the first places I've seen today. In 80 miles, I've seen one small community. It's called Destruction Bay. Destruction Bay in the Yukon. Why am I in the Yukon? I hung my head, had lots of dread. The house was froze, I had on the wrong clothes, so I got a fire going while the wind was blowing. Then I fixed me a meal and thought, it's not a bad deal. And I said, well, what the hell? I'll give it a month or two. The 37 year round residents of Destruction Bay live in one of the Yukon's most remote communities. How long have you been here? 16 years. <laughs> I know. Why did, I don't know. It was just a bad decision, I guess. <laughs> but I'm still here today. <laughs> Between the bank and the weather and the conditions, and I can't think of anywhere else to go, I'll just stay right here. What the hell? <laughs> I'm here now. Might as well retire here. This seems a beautiful spot. Yeah. So I, that's what I do. Fix and paint. Sell a burger, buy a nail. Sell a burger, buy another nail. In the wintertime, for over two months, we have no sunshine here. We're in the shadow of this mountain. But we look across the lake and we see the sun shining on, on the other shore. So occasionally, even if it's 50 below, I'll, get, I'll put on two pair of coveralls and get my snow machine warmed up. And I'll put, put out there five or six miles until I, I can actually turn around and look up into the sky and face the sun. And I spend 10 minutes there shivering and then I come back. People don't live in the north if they don't like their solitude. Got my money, she got my dough. She took my heart and she stole my soul at the city woman. There's definitely a sense of exploration for me in the fact that, you know, I'm discovering aspects of places and characters which have never been seen because they're just so far off the beaten track. Mark is now entering the heart of Canada's Yukon Territory. This vast wilderness has a population of just 30,000, yet it's twice the size of Great Britain. Mark's used to covering long distances every day, but it's not easy in bear country. stop because there's a there's a big black bear and two if not three really young cubs they're just running around on the roadside I'm about 50 meters away and uh, I'm not going to go any closer a mum with young cubs that's not <laughs> that's not to be messed with but thinking on his feet Mark finds a cunning way to give the bears the slip Bet that feels nice and safe in there. <laughs> he uses a passing vehicle for protection. Ah, made it. I'm sure, I'm sure they wouldn't be that aggressive, but that's quite scary. It's still within a meter of those big things. Mark may have avoided a bear attack for now, but he's still got the knights to get through. High risk when camping in a region where your cries for help won't be heard. My main concern through the whole of Canada and Alaska is is bears. Um, <laughs> I've never I've never camped anywhere where I've got to fend myself against against grizzly and black bears. And there's um, you know there's many of them up here. There's more bears than there are people. I've got a few defences. If I'm lucky enough to hear them coming and get out the tent in time, then I've got a, a banger system. This bit shoots off and um, will explode about a second afterwards. The trick is not to fire that um, behind the bear, so the explosion <laughs> scares the bear towards you. <laughs> um, my second defence, if I don't have time to get out the tent and I suddenly have a bear incredibly close, then I've got uh, heavy duty pepper spray. My only last defence is I always sleep with uh, with my knife beside me. Anytime I'm in a country that um, 
as wild animals um, close, I, uh, I also have that beside me. It's an absolute last resort. And, um, you know, against a grizzly bear, I don't think my chances would be particularly good. But, um, but it's something. It's better than my bare hands. And there's one last thing Mark has to do. Well, my food and anything that smells like toothpaste and sunscreen and stuff are now safely in a bag up a tree. So if any grizzlies or other bears come into the area, hopefully they won't associate it with my tent, which is... Uh, quite a distance away. The precautions pay off, and after a bear-free night, Mark is back on the road. So far, he's cycled 1,100 miles and is entering northern British Columbia along the epic 1,300-mile Alcan Highway. This is the main lifeline linking Alaska to the US. Even so, Mark's got no fear of traffic jams here. I was needing a break for the bike and from the bike, and uh, standing in the middle of the road is as good a place as any because I know nothing's going to come past in the next half hour. There's literally nothing out here. Alaska's a couple of weeks that way. The U.S. is a couple of weeks that way. And in between, there's billions of trees and millions of bears. Crawling up a hill. Every morning by the half a day. I find my wind and Mr. Don't be late. I get the up and try to concentrate. But life is just a slow train crawling up a hill. With 11,000 miles to go, Mark is beginning to realize this adventure will be even harder than his record breaking journey around the world. I really feel like I'm in the Rockies now. It's starting to go over, rather than sort of rolling roads all day, these big passes, and uh, this is the highest pass I'm gonna have done, over 2,000 meters. <laughs> oh, but I think I've got another couple of hours climbing yet before I get to the summit. As Mark heads south, he's beginning to have more human contact. But it's not exactly the kind he wants. 90% of the traffic on the road are these huge recreational vehicles, these big RVs, the size of buses. You can drive these massive RVs, and I do mean they're the size of a bus, and tow a car behind it on a normal car driver's license. So you've got elderly Americans driving a bus on quite often narrow roads, and so being on a bike, I'm uh, <laughs> the lowest common denominator and normally shoved to the side. The RVs have large fuel tanks and carry their own provisions, meaning many remote supply stops have closed down. For Mark, this means finding the basics for survival is proving difficult. It's 10 past 11 at night. It's uh, not been a great day. When I got to where I planned to camp, uh, you know, I hadn't packed that much water or food because it looked like a good place in the map. It was, uh, I, I couldn't stop there. I couldn't get any more water. And the next place was 80 kilometers. So I've had to ride on into the night and uh, nothing has passed me in the last two and a half hours. Uh, I just saw my first grizzly bear um, about half an hour ago, so like half past 10 at night and it was about 20 metres ahead of me and just ran across the road. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not enjoying being cycling at this time of night. It's, uh, it's a little bit spooky. Canada's uninhabited wilderness has forced Mark to push huge daily distances, but he's finally arrived at a location where nature will at last treat him kindly. I'm uh, on a walkway through a forest in northern British Columbia, and this is the trail to the natural hot springs. I have been, I've been really looking forward to getting here. My legs have taken a bit of a battering, so natural hot springs might be exactly the remedy I need. <laughs> oh, 
Wow. It is incredibly warm. <laughs> That's got to be good for the tired legs. I'm surprised there's not some bears in here. If I was a bear, I would definitely chill out and have a bath in here. This is cozy. It's not just Mark's body that's been taking a battering. Only 1,300 miles in, his bike has already had one broken pedal and 10 punctures. And he's run out of inner tubes and repair patches. Just had my third puncture in three days. Uh, if I get another puncture, then uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'll have to hitch a lift to the nearest bike shop, which is hundreds of miles away. That's not to mention how the rugged Alcan Highway has completely worn through the rubber of Mark's back tire. His only hope is to switch the tires around. All done. So my back tire's now my front, my front's my back, and um, we'll need to make about another, about another 500 miles before I get to a bike shop. Mark has had hardly any human contact for weeks. But travelling at bike speed is about to give him an encounter with the real Canada. I was standing on the roadside wondering what the free camping was about and just wondering what the sound of music was. Pedal in to see what was happening and just find this little quaint music festival happening for the weekend. There's no signs, it's not advertised, people just know this happens and uh, I've just been welcomed in uh, with open arms, I've been fed and uh, just singing the most uh, most brilliant music from, from all over Canada. This is what I love about travelling, not knowing what's around the corner. In the midst of a heat wave, aching limbs and bike trouble, Mark decides it's time for a break with the locals from the music festival. How far are we going down here? It's about 3k. 3 kilometres? Yeah. And that takes how long? About an hour. <laughs> so, so we're not going anywhere fast? No. <laughs> Fun for the whole family. Taking a tractor tube down the river, is this, uh, is this, this, is this common? Is this, this is this common up here, yeah. <laughs> we do this often. And what, what do most people do in terms of work? The lumber industry is the major one up here. That's where most of us work. And uh, the guy you met last night there, Regan, he's our foreman at work. He's a, it's a lumber industry basically that keeps us going up here. So he's he's a he's a lumberman, but he's also a musician. Yeah, he just recently started playing guitar and found he liked it. Got a band together, and it seems that uh, a lot of people that live in uh, rural parts of Canada have got a talent for uh, art or music or something. Yeah. Well, the cool thing is he didn't even know that he had it. He picked up a guitar and found he liked it, and he's really come along quite a way. <laughs> Refreshed, and with over 2,000 miles under his belt, from the Cottonwood River, Mark has got to tackle 400 miles of punishing hill summits in 40 degree heat before he reaches the US border. There's something about big climbs which focuses the mind. You know, pushing your body through that when your legs are screaming and you want to get off the bike. I'm always just shouting at myself that I'm not going to stop until I get to the top. <sighs> 
it's taken nearly two hours to get from Valley Bottom to the top here. When I started it was all arid and parched and up here and back into the forest in Greenland it just shows the altitude I've gone up. It's uh, good to get these climbs done early because it's uh, 41 degrees now. Oh. The heat wave also brings another potential hazard. There seems to be a forest fire in the in the valley up ahead, and uh, I'm just figuring out whether I can actually carry on past. That was a, a policeman, one of the troopers just coming past and saying that it was not safe for me to carry on cycling down the valley. The, the helicopters are dropping water on the fire. It's a grass fire and forest fire. Hoping it's not going to spread this way, but if it does, I'm going to have to retreat quickly. It just newly started? What happened? As far as I know, yeah. 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 I, would wait, I would wait by your vehicle yep. for the time being. Anyways. Oh, okay. Luckily this time, they've been able to put the fire out before it turned into an inferno. Well, the smell of smoke is still filling the air as I cycle past part of the area which was, uh, which was on fire just an hour ago. There's fortunately a river right down the, the valley bottom here and the, the helicopter could scoop the water out and uh, put this one out before it became too big, but it's still covering an area of probably five or six acres. At last, there's some relief from the heat. It's uh, absolutely pouring out there. I'm trying to hide under a big pine tree as a thunderstorm goes past. Nice place to have a wee rest though. Lovely smells in here. You know the smell of uh, pine forest when uh, when it's raining. That smell of wet grass and tree sap. That thunder's right overhead now. There's been uh, in the news uh, quite a lot of accidents because of the thunderstorms further east, uh, further east in Canada. People being hit by lightning. Especially people in these big RVs, these big recreational vehicles, which are metal, have been touching their vehicles, and then uh, <laughs> lightnings strike. I, I, I'm allowed to laugh because uh, no one's uh, no one's died. Everyone's just been uh, a little bit uh, uh, <laughs> a little bit electrocuted. Um, I laugh because uh, these big RVs are not my favourite things in the road. Mark soon to leave the wilds of Canada and enter the United States through the small town of Osoyoos. So far he's climbed the highest mountain in North America and cycled nearly 2,500 miles, all in just 64 days. That's the customs house just ahead, so I better put my camera away. Let's go to America. I'm in America. <laughs> Great to be here. I know I've been in America before when I was in Alaska, but Alaska didn't really feel like America. Alaska felt like Alaska. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not quite the same. Mark may have had a change of country, but as he heads through Washington State, there's no change in the heat, and the Rocky Mountains haven't finished with him yet. Oh, I'm loving a 
a moment shade in the trees. These um, these climbs in the 40 degree heat are absolutely brutal. I've done hot desert riding before, but I don't think I've ever done such hot hilly riding. These climbs are are long. I mean, you can see how much I'm sweating and what I'm losing from the um, the salt marks on my my shirt. All this white down here, all these what this white shows the amount of uh, salt which I'm losing, which I need to put back in if I'm not going to in the long run get pretty de depleted. It's, it's freezing. After his first proper wash in 500 miles, Mark discovers he's not the only one feeling the heat. Who am I? What do I know? Without love, where shall I go? I've found another couple of cyclists. Um, I've hardly met any going through Alaska and uh, Canada, so it's great to see some other cyclists on the road. And uh, these guys have, have certainly done some big miles themselves and are musicians. We've been traveling over 12 years by bicycle now. We just went over 29,000 just a few days ago. We just crossed the 29,000 mark. 44 countries. 44 <laughs> countries. 44 countries. <laughs> Not as many as you've done. <laughs> 44 countries on a bike. And uh, what, what's your idea when you travel? I mean, what's your main... I mean, you've just played enjoy some... enjoy the people through music and... Okay, so it, it is the music. That's, you know, the bikes and the music. Yeah. So where do, you, where do you normally end up playing your music? We'll go to old age homes, hospitals, jails, prisons, uh, schools. We've been to universities, orphanages, orphanages. homeless we, shelters. We've we've played for the dying. We've even played at funerals. We've played for people that were just born and their their families, of course, and absolutely everything in between. And you will walk a better way, see a brighter day, build a better world for tomorrow and today. Mark has now cycled 2,600 miles and on day 70 is entering the state of Montana. This is cowboy ranch country. Having grown up riding a horse on a Scottish farm, Mark can't turn down the chance to swap two wheels for four legs. He's joining family ranch owner Mona for a day of cattle driving. These are what's gonna protect your legs today, so when you get back on the, the bike, hopefully <laughs> your legs won't be too sore to ride. Okay. Mona, who is looking after me, has managed to find some jeans and a cowboy shirt to fit. <laughs> because there's nothing I'm carrying on the bike which would have uh, been suitable at all for riding a horse. What sort of people are still working the land up here? It's still mostly family ranching and or, or on, people who have bought it that um, come in and for the love of the land and, and Montana and the way of life. But um, in our part of the world, there's still a lot of working ranches family-owned ranches, and the reason being is people are trying to maintain that way of life for the generations to come, which it's becoming harder and harder to do it with, you know, regulation and, and costs and everything involved. So we've seen the cattle and we're going to move up the creek. If they tend to be wanting to go that way, you can kind of ride a little higher and it pushes them down. Come on. So here are the cattle here and it's my job to stay behind them and push them up. Yeah. See, they were all wanting to go that way. It's a, almost a daily job for the cowboys and cowgirls to keep these keep these cattle moving. Come on! Come on! 
actually, you've got the cattle going in the right direction now. This is good. Amazing. First day cowboy. I could do more of this. It's incredible out here. Never ending horizons. Cowboy riding is a lot harder than I thought. I'm exhausted. It's a completely different sort of fitness and muscles than, uh, than cycling a bike, that's for sure. I know I'll be walking funny and I'll probably be pretty saddle sore tomorrow. After a decent meal on the ranch, it's just a few days before Mark is faced with a recurring problem. Finding the 6,000 calories his body requires every day. A chance find from his home country at least gives a short-term solution. I managed to find some Scottish shortbread which is brilliant fuel because uh, it's 100 calories per biscuit. So uh, that box which I've just eaten is 800 calories, which is ideal when you're looking for, um, you know, five, 6,000 calories a day of food. It's, uh, it's hard to find that up here. Mark's been on the go for 87 days and has reached the high desert plains of Utah. Once again, the distances between supply stops are about to catch him out. He's run out of water, and out here, dehydration can be lethal. Ah, it's hard to describe proper dehydration if you've never had it, but oh, it's a craving like nothing else. It's just relentlessly hot out here. I was expecting to be able to pick up water at a little place I saw on the map, and I got there and it was shut. I've only got about 10 miles to go, but it feels like a long way when you feel this weak on the bike. You can't do anything if you don't have proper hydration. I'll get there. Mark is dangerously close to what's known by athletes as hitting the wall. This causes dizziness, extreme fatigue, and eventual collapse. Getting this dehydrated is like running out of car in your fuel. It's just, it's not good for your engine. I can hardly talk, my mouth is so dry and I cannot wait for that first drink. It's absolutely freezing. Such a relief to get here. It is incomparable, the, the feeling of being properly dehydrated and still having to exercise, still sweating and still fighting into a headwind which is just blowing into your nose and mouth and just drying yourself out. <laughs> that didn't last long. Back in control of his game and making sure he doesn't run out of water, Mark's made it to Arizona's spectacular Canyonlands. Shaped by the wind and Colorado River, 
this desert wilderness is as unforgiving as it is beautiful. After a few stressful days, it's not long before Mark is reminded why bike speed is so magical. This is what it's all about. It's um, just gone seven o'clock in the evening and look at the light. It's stunning. <laughs> no cars, just desert, sageweed and this golden sun. It's, it's unbelievable. I, lo I love it at this time of night. Listen. All you can hear is the, the sound of the, the wheels on the road. The only other guy out here is uh, this one over here. <laughs> we joke. I've not lost it yet, don't worry. <laughs> there he is. Now this time of night he tends to cycle along beside me. <laughs> Having survived the desert, Mark's now just 250 miles from the Mexican border. But before he gets there, he faces his highest road summit in North America, the 8,000-foot Alpine Pass of Arizona's stunning White Mountains. I think only at the speed of a bike could you really appreciate the the change. It's as if I've cycled into a completely different country up here. I've uh, been climbing for nearly 25 miles now and I've gone from that arid rock and sand sort of desert I've been passing through for the last week to, uh, to this. Pine forests and greenery. It's wonderful. I love it. Mark's now spent nearly a quarter of a year alone on the road climbed to altitudes of more than 20,000 feet, burned three quarters of a million calories, and sweated over 4,000 miles. And even though he's got eight and a half thousand miles still to go, that's for tomorrow. That's the top. I already feel like I've come a, a long way, but uh, <laughs> there's far further to go. Next time, Mark takes on Central America. A people of passion who embrace life and death. A land of extremes. Do they call it yeah. sport? Yeah, number one, yeah. No, it's not a sport. It's a spectacle of death. From the dangers. I know it just takes one wrong place, wrong time, wrong person, and you're in a really serious situation. To the downpours. Scotland, I'm used to cycling in the rain, <laughs> but this stuff's something else. It's next Tuesday at the same time. On their bikes to win the medals, Team GB are in action at the World Track Cycling Championships tomorrow night. Live coverage begins at 7 on BBC Two.